Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Avalanche Inc. Podcast from the Denver Post. Presented by Applewood Plumbing, Heating, and Electric. Yeah, we have a sponsor now. It's very exciting news. We appreciate their support. Their uh, Applewood Plumbing, Heating, and Electric is a locally owned and operated business since 1973 in the Denver area. This is episode three of Avalanche Inc. Uh, we're going to talk today to Peter Baugh of The Athletic, uh, formerly Avalanche writer for The uh, Athletic. He's now in New York City covering the, the three teams there. Um, yeah, the Avalanche uh, remain one of the hottest teams in the league. Uh, the the new the new guys keep playing well, and the last couple of games have been. The, we'll talk about the week that was. Um, they had a slow start against Columbus and then destroyed the Blue Jackets, who are are one of the worst teams in the league, and then played one of the crazier games of the season uh, on Sunday afternoon at Ball Arena. Uh, they fell behind four nothing to Sidney Crosby. I say would say the Penguins, but that was a one-man show and honestly one of the best individual performances by someone not named Nathan McKinnon that I've seen in a long time. Uh, they fell behind 4 nothing and then rallied back and won in overtime. It was a crazy game. Uh, it was kind of emblematic of just how what kind of a run they're on right now. Uh, obviously, I think one thing is that they don't necessarily want to be getting behind one nothing to the Blue Jackets or 4 nothing to the Penguins or any, any team in, in coming up in the future, but they do... Look, they lead the league in comeback victories this year. Uh, it's something that they know they can do. I think with you know the last couple of weeks here of the regular season, they're going to focus on trying to start better and and not they're, they're not going to want to fall behind one nothing or two nothing or four nothing in any playoff games or every playoff game once we get there. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's just we're we're going to get to our guest now. Um, I'd like to welcome Peter Baugh to the podcast. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Peter from his time covering the Avalanche for the athletic. He now lives in New York and covers the Rangers and a little bit of Islanders and devils as well. Peter, how are you doing? I am well. I'm excited to be, to be back in Denver when, uh, I don't know if I'll already be there when this, when this podcast is, is out, but, uh, I'm heading back on Wednesday and excited for, for Thursday's game. Yeah, it's going to be uh, an interesting game. Well, we will, obviously we're going to get to the game and that's part of the reason why I had Peter on, but, uh, let's, let's start with, um, you know, you've been there for a couple months now. How do you how do you like New York City? How do you like Brooklyn? Just how's it going? Well, New York City is a, a wonderful place. Uh, Brooklyn's really cool. Um, I think that Corey, you and I can both appreciate that there's a lot of really good food in this city, um, and I've I've kind of been taking advantage of that, and my wallet has has taken a hit at points because of it. But I think that. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great place. I, I've really enjoyed living here, and then um, yeah, definitely miss Denver. But the it's been fun. Yeah, I I mean I'm so I lived in New York for the better part of like ten years, and I had told Peter before he moved there it's it's going to be a while before it doesn't feel like you're on vacation or you you just <laughs> it feels like you're in like a different life just walking around that place. But um, yeah, I think I'm still in in the vacation honeymoon state for sure. Um, okay. So let's, yeah, let, well, okay. So let's start with the Rangers. Um, you, you've, you've spent most of your time around them these days. Uh, yeah. they're, they're a pretty interesting team in that, like, you know, they've won a lot of games, they have a lot of points. And I feel like very few people outside of, uh, like the blue shirts, message boards and whatnot are like, this is a team that can beat Florida or Carolina or Boston in the playoffs. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, I we've discussed this. I'm I'm a little bit lower on Boston than than some, but I, I certainly think that like maybe the consensus power ranking among like people I've talked to is that like Florida is the best team in the East, and then Carolina if they get enough goaltending, and then probably New York. Um, so to me, like this is a team that is not. It's not necessarily it, it. Even if it wins the President's Trophy or whatever, it's not the the best roster in the NHL. But it's a team that has a good enough roster that if Igor Shosturkin plays like Igor Shosturkin at its best, it can be really formidable and go on a on a deep playoff run potentially. So it'll be an interesting um, it'll be interesting to see how how the seeding works out who they play in the early rounds, if they're able to avoid Tampa in the first round and, um, and, and stuff like that. But I, they're a team that I'm kind of like, I, I sometimes struggle evaluating too, because I think they're pretty good, but I don't know 
what their next level is if they can like reach that. Um, and I think a lot of it honestly comes down to Shostarkin. Yeah, they've it's it's really weird. I mean, they've been like not not to like completely dive into the history of the Rangers here, but like they had this team for years and years and years that was like they had three or four really good players. They had an all time goalie, and they were all it always just felt like they were a player or two short when it came to like facing the very best teams. Like they lots of playoff runs with with Henrik Lundqvist, one trip to the finals. And he, but even that that trip to the finals was an interesting like that was one of the better teams they had and you know the 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 Kings were just they were they were better and now they like they you know they went into this like quote unquote rebuilding process which lasted like forty five minutes and they now have a team that has three or four really like high level world class players a really great goalie and we're we're talking about them like they're one player short or two player you know what I mean like it just it it does feel like they're in kind of a loop where it's like, this is a very good team. They win lots of games and then we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like it wouldn't, this is a team that it wouldn't surprise me if they're, it's June and they're in the cup final, but it also wouldn't surprise me if they get Tampa in the first round and suddenly are sweating out a game seven against Tampa Bay. Um, it's yeah, it's an interesting bunch. I think the one thing that I've, gone back and forth about is like is this team i i wonder if artemi panarin and his line gets shut down if they have enough um which i guess you could say about any team of like if the abs if you shut down the mckinnon line are they gonna have enough to win four playoff series probably not um but i guess the the evidence is there more with like like panarin had two points in seven games last playoffs and was had okay numbers the playoffs before, but certainly not quite the the player he was in the regular season in the playoffs. So I think he's just so crucial for them. Um, and I think he, I'm sure he knows that, that he has to be at his best in the playoffs. But I think that I wonder about this team of Panarin, if the he's, he's playing with uh, Lafreniere and Trocek and that line has been one of the best lines in hockey. And if, if that line can be contained, I don't know if the Rangers have enough offense um, outside of it. But if, if they continue playing it the way they have been and they get good goaltending and the power plays rolling, then I could see them beating Carolina in the second round. And then suddenly you're in a conference finals and have a chance to win, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, what's it been like covering them besides the, besides the commute out to, to Terrytown there, uh, for people who aren't familiar with New York city, the 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 New York Rangers do not practice inside the five boroughs. They practice like uh, you know in like the real part of New York or whatever you want to call it, New York State, uh, across the river. Um, but just what what is it like? Uh, just kind of, I mean, I've done this a couple of times now. But what's it like jumping in in the middle of the season and trying to get to know everybody and trying to figure out all the different uh, logistical things and 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 also by the way, write good stories too. Yeah, definitely. In the middle of the season has been an interesting that's an interesting twist. And like, I, I still, I feel like for the first two months, it's almost just like establishing yourself and like hoping that people know who you are. And, and I feel like I'm getting closer to that point to where I'm not, I'm not like a, a stranger walking in every day to where like people are, don't know who I am um, to where at least now I feel like most of the players recognize my face to some extent. Um, so I, I feel like I'm getting, getting closer in that regard, but it it definitely, I think that the transition, I mean, it worked out this way and I'm glad it did, but like a, an off season transition, like I think definitely is a little, it probably would be a little more seamless though. It would, I'm sure have struggles that way too. Um, but it's been good there. Um, yeah, I would say like they, they've got a, a few really insightful players that I really enjoy talking to and some good personalities. Um, it's different of like, there's just a, a lot of, there's an army of, of cameras in New York. That's very, that's very real. Like that's a, there's a lot of people wherever you go. So um, I'm sure that'll ramp up even more in the playoffs. Yeah. I've noticed that there's a few more camera people around uh, the avalanche now that the Bronco season is over for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. That, the annual pilgrimage over once. Uh, yeah. Once the Broncos are done. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know you're still paying attention to the Avs when you can. Uh, yeah. They're pretty good. Your thoughts? <laughs> really good. They, I, they look so good. Um, 
I'm disappointed Yoel Kiviranta hasn't been getting as much shine. I'm kidding. I do love I, I I love Yoel Kiviranta. Um but no, I think that they're I mean they look it it is hard to see many teams beating them four out of seven times unless something goes wrong with like injuries and stuff. Um it seems like McFarlane just completely nailed the deadline. It's obviously, it's so funny, like talking about like, did they do well in the trade deadline? You never know until the playoffs come around and you actually see how those moves look then. But like from the games I've watched, like Casey Middlestat looks like a second line center and a good one. Um, Sean Walker looks like he's, uh, I don't think, let me be careful of how I phrase this. I don't think Sean Walker is a better defenseman than Bowen Byron, but I think he, has played better this year than Bowen Byram was playing in an avalanche uniform this year. Um, so you essentially kind of like upgraded there and then you added some, some bottom six depth. And, um, and now the question is like, will Kovalenko contribute anything? Will Landis be able to, to help out at some point? Like it's, it's a deep team and you're starting to see like, there's going to be good, like, or, or at the very least competent players who are going to be scratched game one of the playoffs. And I think that's the mark of a good team. Like the, when the Avs won the cup final, I think game one of the playoffs, Logan O'Connor and Alex Newhook were healthy scratches. And those were like good players. And this year it'll be some combination of like, like I think Kibi Ronta is not the superstar that I believe him to be. Um, but, <laughs> but he's, he, that's like a competent fourth line NHL player who would be in a lot of, opening night playoff lineups and he might just be scratched, you know? Yeah, for sure. Look, they, um, this is, it's been kind of like a running theme of this season for me that like, I feel like their best players are constantly comparing themselves, this team to the 2022 team. And yeah. Right. And like until a couple of weeks ago, there were no teams in the league that were as good as the 2020. So it was like kind of this like constant uphill, like, and also too, like you just, like you said, you just look at the lineup from, you know, those cup final games two years ago with like, you know, a guy like Andre Barakowski on the third line. And you're like, well, this team doesn't really have that. And now it looks a little bit closer to that. <laughs> like they're, they really do have, um, you know, they're the, even the fourth, like the fourth line, like ya- Yakov Trenin made a play the other night uh, against Pittsburgh or the, I guess it was afternoon, whatever. I sound like an NHL coach now, but uh, <laughs> he made a play and I was just like, man, they've had like, they have multiple guys sitting with the Eagles right now that could be the fourth line center for them and it would be fine. But yeah. I don't think either of them are making the play that Yakov Trenin just made because he's like, you know, six, three and 210 pounds. And it was just, you know, you know it's like, all of those guys. I, I, I covered a team in Washington that that added four guys at the deadline one year, and it's it was the exact opposite of this. Like we got to the playoffs, and it was like, well, you know, so and so only has two points in his twelve games, but it'll come around. And then they lost the first round series to the have to the Montreal, and like Scotty Walker barely played, and Jason Arnett didn't fit as the second line center, and so yeah, like I've seen it go the other way. And this is, I was you know, I was just on. Uh, Sirius XM radio earlier today. And it was like, it's, these guys look like Sean Walker looks like he's played for the avalanche for four years, not four yeah. games, you know, like it's, it's just, it's incredible how much, how well these, these four guys have fit. But. And I think some of it also briefly, when you, you were talking about the, how it didn't, it's starting to feel like this could be in the same realm as the 2022 team. I looked at last year's playoff lineup in game seven featured forwards, Brad Hunt, who is a defenseman and also in the AHL, um, Dennis Mulligan, who I believe is in Switzerland, and Ben Myers, who got sent away for a fifth-round pick. So, like, those were three players who were in the a must-win game last year. Um, the the Avs are in a position where they will not need to, to go down nearly that far on the depth chart. Um, but, yeah, the I, I think that, like, it's even just... Um, I think McFarlane... When you add, like last year, the Rangers added Patrick Kane and Vladimir Tarasenko, and Tarasenko was like was very good. Kane was hurt and was not himself essentially. Um, but I think that you can look at teams throughout recent history and see them as teams that tried to do too much, that overspent, and that like tinkered too much with what they had. The Avs, it feel like, got guys that 
with the middle stats, the exception of like, that's like a top six player that they need playing like top six minutes and contributing in a really big role. But the others are guys who are like almost more like role players um, with very defined roles that like essentially should be able to fit in on most teams um, and fit in quickly. And they kind of identified those types of players that I think was, and did so effectively. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I posed this to, I think it was uh, Kyle and Arif the other day when we were watching the, the, I think it was the Columbus game, but maybe it was the Pittsburgh game. Uh, If you simulated a game between the March 20, whatever it is, uh, Colorado avalanche against the November Colorado avalanche when they didn't have Nachuskin and they didn't have, uh, or I guess like it would be December when they didn't have uh, Val Val and Lekkanen. Uh, how badly would this team win? I, th- I think I said the score would be like 5 2 or 5 3. But yeah, it would be that this is a like noticeably better team than than that team. And especially like I, I think some of it too is like Byram. I think Byram is going to, I think that that trade could be a complete win win. Like I think Byram could have a really awesome career. But for whatever reason, like this year, his play was not up to what I mean, he talked about it at multiple points. Right. Like it, it wasn't up to the level that he was when they won the cup or in other years. And so you essentially are like the biggest loss from the 2019 or or from the, the December abs or whatever would be Byram, but they essentially brought in a player and Walker who's playing better than him. Yeah. Yeah. He's been, he's been great so far. Uh, Any, any thoughts on what they're going to do, how how they're going to figure all this out after (laughs) <laughs> like this summer, like, um, yeah. you know, they, they, like Casey Middlestat needs a new contract. Sean Walker could maybe use a new contract. Uh, well, you know, they, the, obviously the big thing is that, is that we we're all assuming that Gabriel Landeskog is going to be able to play next season. And that means that 7 million bucks is coming back on the books. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be an interesting summer regardless of, you know, whether they win one playoff series or four. Yeah. It's going to be fascinating. Cause I mean, they're going to have to, get creative if landis god comes back then unless jonathan drun wants to leave like oh yeah him too a couple, <laughs> a couple million on the table like he's he's probably he's or like like what do you think someone will pay jonathan drun at this point yeah like, I, I mean three my, million no i i mean i i honestly think it's gonna be it, it'll it'll swing like during the playoffs like if he has a good playoffs the way he's playing now like it's going to be like four times five million or five times five million. I mean, it's almost going to be close to what he was, what he got before. Uh, from, yeah. from you know, like he is, you know, in some ways he's exactly he's become the player that people thought he was going to be. You know, and in other ways, I like I was I was actually talking about this with uh, your your colleague Arpin Basu from from Montreal. Like he he looks kind of like Arturi Lekkinen ish, like the way like mm-hmm. his all around game, which is not. You know, when he came out of Halifax, he was going to be like McKinnon. He was going to be a hundred point, you know, dazzling, crazy player. And like he has those skills in there, but he just the way that he's like winning battles in the corners and like playing well defensively. It's like this was not. I don't remember this part of his game. Like let's the Shaq thing. I was unfamiliar with your game. Uh, you know, <laughs> like he. Uh, so yeah, I, look, I you know, if he has a bad playoffs then all of his past is going to come back and it's going to be like, well, he's going to get like less than he probably should. But if he has a good playoffs, I think he gets 5 million a year from somebody and it, and it probably won't be the avalanche, but, and then, you know, and, and, but yeah, go ahead. And even if, even if he has a bad playoffs, I still think he gets a, a more than the avalanche are able to pay. Like they're, if Landis Gog's back, it's going to get really tight really quickly. And they're going to have to probably lose him unless he wants to take like a massive hometown discount to keep playing and, this place that has very clearly helped his career. Yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, it's hard to see that happening. I think, um, yeah, if Landis Gog's back, then they're essentially, they're going to have to count on a number of like guys like Kovalenko, like Malinsky to fill in those like third pair defensemen and like third and fourth line player roles, because they're going to have to, it's going to be a squeeze. And then maybe they move some contracts around of like, um, they might have to choose between Walker and trying to move Manson or something like that, just to like get uh, to figure out which contract works. But as I think we've talked about this before, but you pointed out, but then they're going to be looking for a Manson type player come the deadline next year. So it's, it's a, a tough, uh, it's tough to, to figure it all out. I think, um, 
I do think it makes a lot of sense to just keep bringing Jack Johnson back. Like that, like every time I watch, I'm like, he looks really good. This is as good as I've seen him look since he came over. And he's not, he's, <laughs> he's what 36, but he, he, I, if he's willing to sign for under a million, I'd just keep bringing him back as your third pair defenseman. Yeah. I honestly think it's a different, it's like comparing apples to watermelons or whatever, but like this, you could make an argument. This is the best season of Jack Johnson's career. Like, and not, it's not going to be the most productive. It's not going to, he's not going to, certainly not going to play the most minutes, but he's, it's just, you know, there were, there were things about his, his time in Columbus and the, the other places that he's been where, you know, he, it was, you know, he, he, he was like kind of this, I don't know, like the stereotypical, like he helped you score two, but he, he helped you give up three kind of player where the number, the analytical numbers didn't match up with how much the coaches wanted to play him. And he's found this role here. And it's like, there have been so few times this year when like, it wasn't even a storyline that like, Hey, they need to go get somebody who's better than Jack Johnson to play in that role at the playoff. It was, it was, there was none of that. Like he's, he is their, he is their number six defenseman. He has this very specific role and he's like, he's been very good at it. Yeah. And he, and even the, you mentioned that how the analytics of like uh, underlying numbers have at least recently never been Jack Johnson's friend. And I think some of that is like, like the year they won the cup, the Avs won the cup, like the analytics hated him, but just watching, like, I didn't think it was nearly as bad as those numbers said, but then like this year, the analytics even are starting to like him. Like, like it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely the, like, there's just not, there have been so few moments in a game, even like in a game where it's like, oh, if they had somebody else besides Jack Johnson in that spot, like I just I think he's been a, he's just been a really, you know, really solid fit. And it's, it's, it's been a crazy career for him, obviously, but this is, you know, sometimes you have those guys at the end of their careers where they just find the right spot and the right kind of reduced role. And it just, it just all fits. But yeah. And yeah. so like I would, if I was the abs, I'd, if he wants to be back, they should bring him back. He's a good presence in the room. He, uh, if he can give you these types of minutes and then let him just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I do think like, you know, like big picture stuff, like we, we've known for a while that they were, you know, one of Bo Byram or Sam Gerard was probably not going to be on this team in the near future. And now that Sean Walker is this, if, if Sean Walker is really this good, you might need to like throw him in there and be like, okay, one of, Sean Walker or Josh Manson or Sam Gerard can't be on this team as soon as next year, maybe the year after whatever it is. So um, I do think that there's like probably the fact that they got off of Ryan Johansson's money completely probably allows them to, I guess, it, I mean, some of that'll depend on middle stat too. So like the, I think middle stat and Walker, like what the, how much money they want in the, you know, will obviously play a huge role in all of this. But I think one of, you know, like there, there's probably like one more guy than we're thinking right now. Like there's, they, they're not going to be able to have this guy and this guy and this guy. I think they're going to be able to keep one more guy than we think right now. Just if, if, if everybody, uh, you know, as long as everybody doesn't ask for the absolute, the most money they can, which or whatever, but that, that happens, you know, that, some of that will also depend on, you know, if they win 16 playoff games, then sometimes guys are a little, a little like guys are worth more money, but guys are also worth or willing to take a little bit less to come back. So totally. Yeah. And if you win 16 playoff games, then sometimes like you're willing, like if Jonathan Druin's going to, if Jonathan Druin is getting an offer of like five by five this, this summer, that means the playoffs went really well. And I think the abs would be like, all right, they shake his hand and be like, this was great. Like, thank you for your service. And um, yeah, like it's some, some level of like, if they can't afford all these guys, it probably means things went pretty well in the playoffs. Yep. For sure. That's the uh, flags fly forever as the, as my, yeah, exactly. which is also the name of my fantasy baseball team. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, okay. Before we let you out of here, um, I do this thing with all my guests where I ask them. Uh, so like an avalanche fan comes to New York city to go to a Rangers game. It's their first time in New York city. Where, where should they go and what should they eat? Uh, Sabaro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to make the Sabaro joke at some point here. <laughs> No, I had to jump and ju- beat you to that. Um, well, that's a that's a great uh, great question. There are um, lots of things to do in New York, so I I still feel like I I am figuring out exactly what to to do. But like anytime you can, I'm a big park guy, so 
spending some time in Central Park or Prospect Park, or um, you can find some great museums or, or just like spend some time in the sun is always nice. As for like food, I don't, I don't know if I have like one spot that I'm like, this is the spot that you have to try yet. I'm still kind of like figuring that out. But I had, um, I think you said you've had Ruby Rosa pizza. Before. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was I, I. That's probably the best pizza I've had so far in New York. I think. Okay. Yeah. There's a that. That's definitely in my like two or three best uh, best pizza places for sure. If you're, yeah, I. Good. I mean, I've I've I think I've covered more games in that area than, 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 than at least at this point than, than than Peter has. But I would say if you're if anybody's going to Madison Square Garden, like my favorite place, right near like literally a five minute walk or whatever, is um. There's like a it's I think it's Thirty Third Street is it's like the Koreatown neighborhood. And like, that's, I look, there's a million places to eat in New York city, obviously. But if you're like at the garden, I think, I think there's like seven or eight really, really good places there and you can't really go wrong. And uh, yeah. so that's, a, that's and kind of always in my the arena, the food in the arena, which I've gotten well acquainted with because they don't have a media meal and they have give you vouchers, but like they've actually got pretty good, like local restaurants that have like arena uh, booths or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. they've got some, some okay places in the arena too. All right. And last thing, I mean, what's the, uh, what was like kind of your go-to place, uh, in Denver? That's, that's a good question. It changed at points. I, um, towards the end, I really loved Steuben's on 17th. Um, I would get partially cause of their milkshakes. I, I really loved the milkshakes there. Um, that was a great spot. I really liked, uh, the spice room on, um, I think that's way up on Colfax. It's Indian food. Um, so yeah, kind of a, a, a good mix of places. And, um, what else did it subculture is a good sandwich shop in, uh, in Cap Hill. Um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of good ones and, um, and I will probably hit some of them up when, when I'm back in town. All right. Well, Peter, thanks for doing this. I will, uh, see you whenever you're in town, I'm sure. And, uh, yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks again. Yeah, I'll see you soon and looking forward to the game. Okay, thanks again to Peter for his time. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, the week coming up. Uh, obviously, the Avalanche play the Rangers on, on Thursday night at Ball Arena. They also have a Saturday afternoon game against the Nashville Predators, who are basically the also the co-hottest team in the league. Uh, the Predators have just been on a roll. Uh, they've gone from being like a fringe playoff team to no doubt they're going to be one of the wild card teams. Um, so that's going to be an interesting game. And those two games kind of together kind of lead me into my, the big question for the week. So my big question is, do the, is there anything that we need to take from the last three games? So the, the, you know, the avalanche have won a bunch of games in a row. They look, you know, they look great, but the past three games, there have been, pretty sizable chunks of all three of them where they, they have not been at the level that they want to be at. And Jared Bednar referenced this. I, th- I think it was after the Columbus game. Uh, look, every game is not going to be like that game at Edmonton uh, earlier this month. That was like peak NHL hockey, at least in the regular season anyway. And that was about as well as the avalanche have played over the course of 65 minutes uh, or 64 minutes and 59 seconds uh, all year. And so look, no NHL team can play like that every night. Just look at what has happened to the Oilers since that game. They have, they have been on kind of a rocky road, but the avalanche have played three games in a row now where they won all three, but there, again, there have been, I think that one of the biggest things near the, at this time of year is hard to decipher is a, a really good team like the avalanche playing a team like Columbus, playing a team like Montreal. Um, you know, what can you really take from those games? Can they, I think honestly, coaches are probably just worried about, getting out of them healthy, making sure guys aren't, there aren't bad habits or bad trends forming. And I think that's part of what I'm getting at here is that these three games, St. Louis is probably not going to make the playoffs. They're about to be eliminated. Columbus and Pittsburgh are definitely not making the playoffs. The sort of the, 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 the uneven play in the past three games, is this a sign of something that they need to fix over the next month or so before the playoffs start? Or is this just, they're on a roll and they've played really well against great teams and, you know, you can sometimes just play down to your level of competition. I, th- I think we'll learn a little bit more this week whenever they do play New York and Nashville, two pretty good team, you know, one really good team, one pretty good team. Uh, and then they have a couple games on the road and then 
they really do have a finishing kick that's going to be, you know, Edmonton, Dallas, Winnipeg, Vegas, Edmonton. Those those are really good teams, and that's going to be a more of a barometer of where they're at. But so yeah, I think I think that's just the thing. I think there's some things that they need to clean up. Look, they're still winning a lot of games. The new guys still look great. They look like you know one of the teams that can win the Stanley Cup. But I'm I'm pretty sure there's some there's a few things here and there in their game that they're going to be looking to you know just just clean up over the next week. So before we get out of here, I'm just you know. Uh, my last segment's the the best thing that I ate this week. Uh, it's been kind of a weird week, a busy week, lots of college hockey stuff happening. So um, I went down to Colorado Springs to check in with the Colorado College guys. They literally just missed the NCAA tournament by the slimmest of mar- one of the slimmest margins in like you know NCAA men's hockey history. And like it was literally one. This is now two years in a row where they had just won one more game. If they had just won the NCAA. See, final last year, they would have got in as a Cinderella. If they had just won any one of the games that they lost this year, it probably would have put them ahead of UMass and got them in. Anyway, uh, I was in Colorado Springs. I was needed to get a meal, and I, I ate at uh, Rasta Pasta, which is right down the street from Colorado College's wonderful new arena, Ed Robson Arena. If you, you haven't been to a game there and you like college hockey or you just want to see a beautiful arena, it, that place is great. Uh, but Rasta Pasta was... Uh, look, it's it's kind of in my wheelhouse. I love Italian food. I have since I was a kid. I, as I've gotten older, I've I've grown to love foods from all over the world, and I love Caribbean food. And it's kind of a you know mishmash of the two. And uh, it's just a, it was just a fun fun place, great place for lunch. Would be a great place for dinner. Um, so next time you're in the Springs, if you're looking for something to eat, you're near Colorado College. Check out Rasta Pasta. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for listening again to the Avalanche Inc. podcast. I want to thank our partners, uh, Applewood Plumbing, Heating, and Electric, for for their support. And I'll look forward to talking to you again next week. 